Again, we'd like to welcome everyone to Berean Bible Fellowship this morning, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to the end um, of the chapter. Um, actually, there's a little bit more that I want to talk about in the next three weeks, but just for today, Acts uh, 4.32 to the end of the chapter. So if you can, in the honor of God's word, stand, and let's read that passage. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one said that anything that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or of houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field belonging to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Lord, we want to just come to you this morning as we read this passage and we go through the, the passage over the next couple of weeks. Lord, is the song we just sung, make us, make us one, make us one united body, make us one united in your love, united in our, our service and dedication to you, united in our salvation. Make us one. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to spend the next three weeks on this passage. and I didn't read the whole passage today, so a little bit of a homework assignment is go home and read Acts chapter 4, uh, starting verse 32, and read all the way uh, to um, uh, verse 11, 511, because that's what we're going to be spending the next three weeks on. And in, one, in, in this week, this first week, I want to focus on um, the one heart and the one soul or one mind depending on what translation you have, uh, one body, which would translate into one church, and then the one mission. And in, in doing so, we're going to learn that they had unity. The church had unity. They had one heart. They had one soul. They became one church. And that way, they were able to fully support their one mission, which was to tell people about the lost. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 33. And as a result, great grace was upon all of them, on, on, on the entire church. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about this week. And then next week, we're going to come back in a, in a second part of that passage that uh, I talked about Barnabas. And, and I, I want to share the story of Barnabas uh, to give us hope. You know, as we, as we study the book of Acts, uh, we study the life of Peter, and we study the life of Paul, and we study the cast of supporting characters. And we might study that, and we might conclude that, you know, I'm never going to be a Peter, I'm never going to be a Paul. Just not in my DNA, okay? But we can all... Be a Barnabas. We can all be an encourager. We can all serve in the shadows in supporting and encouraging others to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And as an example of that, you know, a lot of you guys play fantasy football. And you you know the quarterbacks, and you know the running backs, and you know the wide receivers. But how many of you know the nose tackle on your favorite team? Know his name. But if you don't have those four guys up front, the quarterback's never going to throw a pass. The lineman is the unsung hero. Barnabas is kind of that unsung hero of Acts. Peter and Paul get all the attention. But as we study the life of Barnabas, you're going to see that Barnabas was all, he was there the whole time. And he's in the shadows. Then in week three, uh, we're going to be challenged with integrity, the question of integrity, with, with our own integrity. And this part I didn't read today. This is the homework assignment. And we're going to see, um, after we've seen the strength of the unity, and we've seen with one church, and we see how one heart and one soul and one mind and one body, 
becomes one church and empowers the church, the New Testament church, to fulfill the great uh, commission, the purpose to give the testimony of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. After all of that, after all that good stuff we're going to talk about the next couple weeks, we're going to study, um, after we study the life of Barnabas, we're going to study the life of Ananias and Sapphira and see how sin and the negative effects of sin brought judgment upon them and the church. And then here's the, the theme that we're going to come to in the next three weeks. The question I want to ask ourselves every Sunday for the next three weeks is, do I want to be the one who grieves the Holy Spirit and brings judgment? Ananias and Sapphira. Do I want to be the one who builds unity, that brings the church together? Do I want to be the glue that holds the church together, that builds that unity? And then how can I be a Barnabas? How can I be a Barnabas that is an encourager in the church? So that's what we're going to talk about. And, and I want to say something before I get too far into it. I think our church does really well in this unity thing. I think we, we, we are one church. I think we are one body. We are one fellowship. We are one family. I think we do this very, very well. And so a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about the next three weeks, I don't really think I need to preach to this church. But I, as I was sharing with Elaine, I said, you know, just because we're doing it well doesn't mean we don't need to be reminded why. It's important. So I, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, so, um, but I think we need to be reminded why it's important. We're doing it. We're doing it really well. Maybe we could do it a little bit better because we can always do better. But um, I wanted to bring that into attention. So today I want to focus on the word unity. Unity is going to be the theme of today's message. So again, let's pray, and then let's, let's get into the, today's passage. So Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for this family. Thank you for the love and the caring that I see one for another in this church and in this church body. Lord, I, I just thank you for the privilege of being the pastor of this church and, and, the, and the family and the unity that you brought. And Lord, I thank you so very much for the gift of this church and the gift of this family and this fellowship. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul. And some of your translations may say one mind. So when we look at one heart, let's, let's kind of break these words down a little bit. When we look at one heart, and we think of matters of the heart, uh, we think of passion. The word, the word passion would come to, to mind, or a powerful and compelling emotion, just an emotion that is overwhelming, uh, so powerful that it just kind of overwhelms us. Uh, it's a strong feeling or a strong desire. Now, to say that the church had one heart is to say that they shared a common passion. The church shared a common passion. The church had the same powerful or compelling or strong feeling or desire for the same thing. They were on the same page of music. They, they wanted the same things. The, the, the collective body of the church wanted the same thing, the same goals, the same outcome. And then they were one soul or they were of one mind. Now when we begin, we, we look at that word, the soul is the moral aspect of life. The soul is also the eternal aspect of life. So to say that they had one soul is to say that they had one spirit, uh, one principle of life. They had one set of feelings. They had one set of thoughts, one set of actions. They moved as one. They moved in unison, they moved as one. To say they had one soul was to say that they had one spirit, one life, one shared emotion, one shared thought, one shared purpose. Yet, they were many. The many became one. Many people many parts 
one church, one body. Now, to fully understand this picture that Luke is painting for us here in, in the book of Acts, we need to look back at the Hellenistic Greek culture in the New Testament times. And I want to read a little bit from the New American Standard Commentary here for a second, just to kind of help you understand what, what the, the strength of this argument or the strength of what Luke is trying to say here. The more common than this myth was the Greek idea of friendship, according to which true friends held everything in common, pata konia, and were of one mind, mia psyche. Aristotle is reputed to have defined a friend as one soul dwelling in two bodies. Marriage is as close to that as you'll ever get. The Bible says the two shall become one. One soul, one purpose, one, one goal, one set of goals, one set of priorities. But think about this. Two friends, one soul, dwelling in two bodies. That's, that's what it means to become one. Such expressions became commonplace, are founded in Roman writers such as Cicero, and well as the Hellenistic Jew Philo. Luke described what have what have Luke's, Luke's description would have evoked an immediate response in his Gentile readers, because again the Gentile, the Greek and Romans, that they esteemed as an ideal, what the Greeks and the Romans esteemed as an ideal had become a reality in this young Christian community. Two people so united that they had one heart, one soul, one mind, one spirit, one set of thoughts. They have one mind, for they shared freely with one another, truly common both in soul and in means. The main business of the community was, of course, the witness of Jesus Christ, and the apostle continues to do so with great power. And the word translated great power in this passage is dynamis, which we get the word dynamite. Get into that a little bit more in the as we go on today, um, the new church, New Testament church, had not only become this this Greek philosophy, this this Greek mythical philosophy of of oneness, two friends, one body, uh, uh, one soul, two bodies, but the New Testament church it also became what Jesus spoke of in the Gospels. Turn with me to John chapter thirteen, John thirteen thirty five. Jesus wrote this. Jesus said this. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now this is Jesus talking about. Jesus defining what the church will look like. The world will know that you are my children, that you are of my church, of my people by how you love the rest of the body, the rest of the church. They had become one church, one family, and they had given a testimony to the world by how they cared for each other. And this testimony was strong and it was powerful. In John 17, 21, again recording Jesus' words, Jesus wrote this, that they may all be one. As Jesus is praying here, this is actually a prayer. Jesus is praying to God on behalf of the church that they all be one, just as you, Father, God, are in me, so God is in the Son, and I in you, the Son is in the Father, that they also may be in us, that we might be in fellowship with God the Father and God the Son, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The world will, will, will believe in Jesus Christ when they see the body of Christ as one, united in, in soul, mind, and spirit, and, and purpose. They shared life. They had no desire for self-gratification. They were living in the spirit of Paul's writings to the church in Philippi. And again, this is Paul writing this time, not Jesus speaking, but, but Paul writing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. 
Count others. Count the body is more important than yourself. The body is more important than the individual is the idea here. And, and the New Testament church was doing this. So the church of Acts was doing this. And they became a powerful testimony in their community. They were focused outside of themselves. They were focused outside of their own passions. They were focused outside of their own desires. Their focus was outward towards the needs of others. And because their, need, their, their focus was outward towards the needs of others, they were reaching the lost world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Giving their testimonies of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both in word and deed. They didn't just talk the talk. You'll hear this sometimes. People can talk the talk, but can they walk the walk? Going back to Veterans Day in the military, we can see that in the soldier world. They talk the talk, but can they walk the walk? These were Christians who didn't just talk about being Christians. These were Christians who walked the life of a follower of Christ. And as a result of that one heart, and as a result of that one soul, they became one body. They became one church. And it was demonstrated by this next sentence. There was not one needy person among them. Look at verses 34 and 35. There was not one needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them, and brought their proceeds of what was sold. In the true spirit of koinonia, no one claimed that anything was his own. The church lived by the, the phrase, what is mine is yours. If I have it and you need it, use it. What is mine is yours. They shared everything in common, they had everything in common. And again, I'm going to go back to the back to the Greek culture here, but they back to the Old Testament too. They lived a combination. They were living a combination of an Old Testament principle that was taught back all the way back into Deuteronomy. You want to go to Deuteronomy 15 with me now? They were living the principle that was taught all the way back, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and they were living the Greek ideal or the Greek dream. Let's first let's, let's look at Deuteronomy. It's a little bit of a long passage, but I want you to get the whole story here. At the end of every seven years, I'm reading 15.1, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor, and he shall not exact it from his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner you may extract it, but whatever of it yours with your brother, your hand shall release. Give freely to your brothers. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you, and, he shall, and, and you shall lend to many nations, but you should not be a borrower. And you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. This was a promise. If they kept the promise by not... By, by releasing the debt to the brothers, God was promising them that they would be a nation of lenders, not a nation of borrowers. And they would be a nation who ruled nations, not a nation under rule. If among you one of your brothers should come, become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your hearts or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend to him sufficiently as his need. 
whatever it may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you may say the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eyes look grudgingly on the poor brother and you give him nothing and he cries to the Lord against you and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudgingly when you give to him because of this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you are undertake for there will never cease to be poor in the land therefore I command you you shall open wide your hand to your brother to the needy and to the poor in your land if someone was in need you were to loan them money you were to loan them what they needed if they needed an ox, you could loan them an ox. If they needed a donkey, you could loan them a donkey. Now, you would loan them what they need. Now, the person that you loaned that to, that you gave that use of, that oxen, or maybe you gave them some grain to get them through the winter because they had a bad harvest, or you gave them help. Now, they were to try to, as best they can, pay you back. It was, it was, it was to be kind of a loan, but they were to try to pay you back. But in the seventh year, every seven years, it wasn't the seventh year from the time of the loan, but every seven years, like on a calendar year, all debts in Israel to be, were to be forgiven, forgotten. All land was supposed to be returned to its original owner, and all debts were supposed to be forgiven. And then in the 50th year, in the year of Jubilee, it was even a bigger celebration. But every seven years, your debt was wiped clean. Your slate was supposed to be wiped clean. You were, it was kind of like this financial reset. Everything was just zeroed out. All debts were forgiven. Israel did not do that. In fact, if you go back and you study the Old Testament, and you study the reason why God allowed Israel and Jerusalem to be destroyed, one of the reasons listed there is that they did not celebrate the seventh year of sabbatical. They did not celebrate the year of Jubilee. They, um, they failed to live by the standard that God had ordained them to live by, and they, they failed to do this. The people were lo loaning money to the poor, and instead of forgiving them in the seventh year like God had told them to do, they were extracting usury or, on high, uh, or high, very high interest. And instead of releasing them in the seventh year, uh, a lot of people were becoming indentured servants or slaves to pay off their debt. And so they were, they were not being released. So instead of helping the poor, which is what God had commanded, what they were doing is they were extorting them. And that is one of the reasons why God allowed Israel and Jerusalem to be destroyed, because they failed to live by that standard. But now, in the New Testament church, they're getting it right. That's the point we're trying to make. This was the standard. That was the Old Testament standard. That was what God had commanded back in Deuteronomy. And Jerusalem and Israel were destroyed because they weren't doing it. But now the church in Jerusalem, the New Testament church, was living by that standard. That's what they were doing. Now I want to read again from the New American Standard. Because um, I want to, I want to give, I want to shift gears to the to the Greek philosophy, to the to Hellenistic culture, so you can see the the powerfulness of this testimony. Um, many inter interpreters have seen Luke's description of the Christian practice here as reflecting the Greek ideals, particularly in such phrases as one mind or once or psychomia uh, or all in common, kapita konia. The Greeks shared a common myth. That in primitive times, people lived in an ideal state in which there was no ownership, but everything was held in common. Some attributed such a practice to the Pythagoreans, to Plato, envisioned his ideal republic as one devoid of all private ownership. They shared everything in common. Now, there, the New Testament church of Acts would have spoken in volumes, this, this living of one thing, they were fulfilling the Old Testament law. They were fulfilling what, what 
what Moses had given to them in the book of Deuteronomy. They were living this shared everything in common. They were living a version of reality that the Greek culture could only dream about. They had dreamed about it. They had tried to achieve it, but they had never successfully did it. What made their testimony even more powerful is that we must understand that this was voluntary. Some people have taken this passage and, and used it as a means to, to um, for socialism and communism. But this was not socialism. This was not communism because it was not compulsory. It was voluntary. See, socialism and compulsory is, it's, or socialism and communism is compulsory. The government or the state takes it away and then shares it with others. This was not a compulsory taking. This was a, this was a voluntary giving. So it's not socialism. It's not communism. It was, it was, a, it was a dream of the Greeks. Um, it, it was voluntary means by which those of means, those who had extra would voluntarily sell of their nest egg. We'll use that word on purpose. I'll come back to that again. To meet the needs of the poor. Let me explain to you what I mean by, by nest egg. If I have a job, and let's say I make $1,000, and out of the generosity of my heart, I give $100 away. I still have 900 but next week I can make another thousand dollars, so I'm only out a hundred dollars. Because next week I can make a thousand dollars again, right? I've only given that hundred dollars away one time. But let's say I have a hundred acres of land, and I grow barley on this hundred acres of land. And because I have this hundred acres of land, I have abundance. Now I could I could give the proceeds of ten acres of my hundred, and that would be a tenth, that would be a tithe. But I'd still have the hundred acres. And I would still have next year's crop on that hundred acres. That's not what they were doing. They were selling 10 acres. They were selling their land. They were selling their means of support. They were selling their means of, of financial security. They weren't giving of the crop. They were giving the means by which they could grow the crop. They were cashing in their IRAs, their 401ks kind of thing. This was, this was, a, this was a gift of, of their future, not of their present, but a gift of their future security. They were saying, our, our friends and family are, are in such need that I am going to give of my future so that they can have a present. This was... This was a deeper gift than just a tie. This was a true committed gift. And then they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed as each had needed. So those who had sold land and houses, they took the proceeds and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And then the apostles were able to distribute to those who had need. As we get on to the book of Acts, the apostles said, hold time out. Too much work here distributing this money, and that's why we have deacons. That's a couple chapters on. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. But this is what they did. And because that they there was because of they had this one heart, because they had this one soul, and because they became one body, they became one church, they took care of each other, and they were able to boldly. Again, we, we talked about the boldness. We must be bold in our testimony, we must be bold in our faith, we must be bold as we share the gospel. But because they were living this life of caring and love and supporting each other, they were more boldly and with great power. They were able to focus on the one true mission of the church. Verse 43a, and with great power. Again, the word dynamite or dynamis, their power, or dynamis or dynamite or dynamism with great energy, with great power, with explosive power. With power that shook the society, that shook the moral fabric of Jerusalem, they were able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, and they were being heard because the 
foundations of culture were being shattered. They were living the Greek ideal. They were living the Old Testament law and the foundations of the community, the foundations of society were being changed and it gave their testimony power. It's no wonder that from this point on, if you go back in the beginning and look at the book of Acts, from this point on there's an interesting phenomenon. The church is no longer numbered. You know, they added 3,000 this day and they added 5,000 this day. We're not going to see that anymore in the book of Acts. You know why? Because the church is growing too fast to count. The calculators and tabulators can't keep up. The church is growing so fast that it can't even be counted anymore. Now our takeaway is this. If we are to reach a lost world, if we're to reach the lost world beyond the confines of this building, this community, or this city, or this town, or this state, this nation, this world, we, as a church, must be one heart. We must have one soul. We must provide for the needs of others. And we must be dedicated, fully dedicated, to the one true mission of the church, which is to evangelize the lost and share our testimony as salvation. And when we do that, we will experience the abundance and the overflowing of God's grace. Again, look at verse 43 to the end of that verse. And great grace was upon them all. Why was grace upon them all? Because they become one heart one mind, one body, one soul, one, one spirit. They were dedicated to one purpose. And they were sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and people were being saved in God's grace. His abundant grace fell on them all. They were all touched by God's grace. Now we're going to leave it there for today. And we're going to pick our story back up next week with Barnabas the Encourager. And I'm going to call him the nose tackle of the book of Acts. He was in every play. He played every down. But the announcer never announced his name. Because he just did his block and attack. And I want that to be an encouragement to us. Because we might not ever be able to throw a 50 yard spiral. Let alone catch one. But we can all show up play our part play our role we can all be an encourager like Barnabas that's next week let's pray Lord I thank you for this morning thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning again I thank you for this church and I thank you for how you are bringing this church together as one body one heart one soul and one purpose I, and seeing people work together uh, working to finish the work on the bathrooms and People come together, everybody doing a little bit different thing, but they're all coming together in one heart, one body, one soul. And, and Lord, I pray for the opportunity that we're going to have uh, at the Christmas parade to, to be a lighthouse here on Main Street, that we build, invite people into the church and, 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 with a, and share the gospel with them as they are waiting for the parade to go by. Lord, I thank you for this church. And Lord, I pray that as we go forward in the next week, Lord, that we would ask ourselves, how can I be an encourager? To the church. How can I be the one that encourages others? In your name we pray. Amen.